Take your Bibles this morning, open them to Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to confuse you a little bit here. Uh, we're not engaging our Galatians study, and we haven't skipped the whole chapter, but I, I do want to finish our look at spiritual depression with a, a closing sermon on the whole issue of being um, someone who helps, somebody who cares, somebody who, who is thoughtful of others. Um, this is a sermon that's more about exhortation. It's more about encouragement. Um, my coaching aspects will come out. And I just want to want to encourage you to uh, listen with your heart and with the spirit and with the word of God. Let me pray. Father, we do again thank you for the morning. Thank you for the joy it is to be able to express your goodness, your character, your kindness in our life. We just ask that you would teach us, Spirit, Father, through your word as well. And we just uh, ask that we would be the type of people that are not only showing the redeemed life, but showing the characteristics that you manifest. May we be copiers of that. And may we show your love in the midst of, of life, in the midst of deep despair, and for those around us. May we be listeners, and may we be doers as well. Be with your servant, I pray. Amen. Pastor has an issue. Um, I got 20 minutes and a 40 minute sermon. So um, I got to kick it in high gear for you a little bit. So, but also give me a little bit of grace towards the end. Uh, there's much to be said about this kind of wrapping this whole thing up. And it's, it's, it's important for us to, to look about how do we care for each other. Body life is very important in the church. Scripture calls us to be a body, to be a family. Uh, to be engaged in each other's lives. You think about fellowship as being something that is, is the only thing that, that we intimately have because of Christ Jesus. It, it extends itself in the care, care in which uh, even uh, Casey read as far as casting our care upon him. This whole issue of, of shepherding and listening and, 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 and caring for each other is of great importance, especially when life happens, in which it does with trials, despairs, and issues. Too often in the midst of it, the person who struggles in this life with trials and spiritual depression, they feel like they are on an island. You ever felt that way? You ever felt isolated with you and your trial in the midst of thinking, God, are you even there? Let alone are God's people there. And so we come to a, 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 an interesting passage that I think that will, will stir our minds towards these things. It is the intention of the body of Christ in which Christ has laid down, not only as the head and being the head, but to instruct his people to be engaged with each other. We are to, to grow in Christ together. We are to be equipped in the word of God together. We are to live life together. And so we have a great concern for each other. And so I think this text kind of gives us a setting. And let me read it for us. If you look with your eyes to verses 1 and 2 of Galatians 6. Paul says this. It says, brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Two verses. That has a context that is helpful for us to understand just in a, in a small way. Paul is speaking to Christians here. He, he comes out of the shoot in verse 1 calling us brethren. Those who are, are part of the family. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. They are those who are saved. They are, are the ones who are walking in the spirit. And the text says that, that spiritual Christians or those who are filled with the spirit have a responsibility to pick up a weak, tired, a lonely fellow brother and sister in Christ. In particular, he, he, he's concerned about those who have been caught in a trespass, in a sin. And what's often sometimes happening is that uh, life spirals out of control. And in the center, we realize we, we get stuck in it's much like quicksand and we just don't know how to get out. 
We repent and repent and we ask for forgiveness, but we just need a helping hand. When it comes to spiritual depression, which we defined as infected sadness, it is a pit of quicksand where somebody is, is trying to figure out life and the meaning of it. We've spoke often about the reality, which is not really reality at all. It's, it's kind of a, a made up, speculated idea of what's actually happening in life to some degree. However, when someone is stuck in an infected sadness, it will often lead to sin. And we've already looked at this. Um, and I just want to remind you that, that having spiritual depression is not necessarily sin in the scripture itself, but often depression leads to sinfulness. It leads to a, maybe a more fleshly approach in life and spills out into those whom we love. They're frustrated, they're weak, they're oftentimes in and out of the flesh and the spirit. And Paul helps us here. Situation is a person is caught in sin, they recognize it, they've repented, but they need help, and it's noted or seen by other believers. Which tells us something, beloved. It tells me that, that we are to be engaged. Just, just to step back just a little bit. We are to be engaged and be observant and listening to, to those around us. As a father of six children, I'm always teaching. I have five girls, young ladies, some still young girls in my house. And I'm constantly telling them, look around you. Be observant. Be, be, be concerned about what's happening so many steps ahead of you. Now, especially when they drive. I want them to, to be aware of those things and those cars and what people are doing. There's much more to driving. Uh, one of my daughters, who I won't name names, Jordan, she, she said, Dad, I passed driver's training. I am good. I said, honey, I'm not so much concerned about you. I'm concerned about others. And driving is like that. And the spiritual life is like that. You are saved and redeemed in Christ Jesus, but are we concerned about those who are around us? This is a, a hypothetical situation, but yet a true one, Paul states before us. Something that happens, no doubt, on a daily basis. And if we would only observe and look. The word caught here uh, can mean a couple of things, and, and I think they mean both things. I think Paul has in mind both of these definitions. First, it has the idea of a person who was caught, uh, was actually involved in the sin when they have been seen or observed. And second, it has the idea of a person being ensnared or, or enticed or drawn into, and then they wake up and realize, what have I got myself into? I think it's that second part. Uh, being caught where spiritual depression comes in. I, I, I think we don't wake up and say, you know what? I'm going to be a spiritual depressed person today. I, I think it just overcomes with time and, and with issues and life and, and pressures and, and trying to think of, and all of a sudden you find yourself in a funk. They are much like a person who, who's been trapped or caught I've been observing flies lately. I don't know about you. I make sure that you don't get in the house. Uh, they're starting to die off. But I often wonder, you know, a fly, when he flies around and he sees a web, I don't think he's thinking, I'm going to go be a spider's lunch. I think he's looking for a landing spot that he thinks it is safe and, 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 and maybe even bring him peace until he can go do what a fly does. And then when he tries to take off, guess what happens? He can't. And he's stuck in the midst of that web. And the flies could think, and we could hear, and the spider comes. I'm pretty sure they're saying, oh my word. Here comes a big, ugly, you know, hairy monster, right? Here comes the spider. 
and what the spider does to him. And kind of, you can think that through. But I, I think this is where, where depression leads us to. It's interesting that this word would, would, would be in Paul's mindset. The Greek here allows, like I say, for both of those, somebody who knows that they're doing sin and somebody who, for lack of better words, happens into sin. There are times when sin catches us and there are times when we catch sin. Uh, yet, more importantly, is not necessarily the sin. And if you were to read this passage in context, uh, the following verse, verses is all about the restorer, the spiritual ones, the ones who are not caught in the web or in that sin. And Paul says your response is going to be the same. Our responsibility as, 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 in the body of Christ is to be one who seeks. And look at the text. It says to restore. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Uh, maybe simply stated, maybe it's just the one who needs to restore is, 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 uh, needs to be mindful of those who need a pick-me-up, a, a pick-up. Somebody to be plucked out of the web, to be an encourager, to be an ex order. Do we live in a life of sarcasm, a, a, a life of uh, uh, pretty easy that we run to the flesh and we can just knock each other with a two by four? For the redeemed in Christ, you have been saved by the blood of Christ. And if you look at anything in Christ, he is, is nothing but an encourager. picks us up when we are down. When a person stumbles or, or gets tangled in sin, he needs to be picked up. And often he needs assistance to, to get out of the mess that he finds himself in. He needs help. Why? Because they're weak. They need their minds changed. To be renewed. To be focused on Christ. I think that's a natural response. If we were to see a, an older lady or a pregnant lady fall down, what do we do? Men, we rush to their aid. When we see, is she pregnant? No. <laughs> okay. I, just, I just saw some laughter over there. I didn't know if you needed to tell me something, honey. Okay. I'll get, I'll get focused. Spiritually speaking, do we look around with spiritual eyes seeing who needs to be picked up? When we see someone who has fallen in sin, uh, when we see somebody maybe not naturally sitting by you anymore, what's going on? Their attendance is starting to lack. Do we fuddle in my mind. Sometimes I get myself thinking, well, they got lots of other things to do, but maybe they are a person who needs a call, needs a visit, needs somebody to reach out to them. Brother, and if anyone is caught in, a, in any trespass, I mean, he's, he's opening the door. He's not naming a particular sin. You who are spiritual, restore. That word restore is kind of strange too. It's like you, your job, when you see somebody who is uh, infected with spiritual depression, it, it, it's a word in the Greek that means to mend. To restore means to, to like take a broken bone and, and set it back in place. Why? So it can be useful again. Be useful for, for the king and the kingdom and, and for the purpose in which God has called them. And redeem, redeem them. And then he goes on to say, you who are spiritual. He, 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 sometimes people think, well, I don't have a, a seminary degree. I, don't, I haven't studied the scriptures. I, don't, I haven't been saved. That, that's not his direction here. 
like I said earlier, those who are spiritual or those who are in Christ Jesus, who by happen not to be caught in that sin that they see their brother or sister in. And they are called to come to restore, to mend, to, to put back in place such a one. And these next words are so imperative to our attitude as we approach that thing, because I know that in our flesh that we look at people and we want to be fair sake and we want to whack them with a two by four and we want them to get in line. But beloved, listen at the words of God here. Those who restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. That's a very interesting word. As the idea of being tender. Somebody who comes along with spiritual truth to be able to, to know that, 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 you know what, there might be some pain in resetting this bone, but, but understand we do it with a heart of love. And we get that. We should get that. I'll never forget the time when I was a baseball coach. There was an umpire that totally blew the call, right? Coach is always right. And so I go out there, and I, I was challenged with my approach to the umpire because the umpire, it was pretty interesting. I come, I come running out there, and I said, what did you see? And the umpire started backing up. And so what do I do? I keep on coming. I want to talk to him. My approach wasn't the best. And, and I had a, a godly man in the stands tell me that. I said, Bear, I, I don't think it's necessarily wrong that you went out and talked to the umpire. By the way, you got the call wrong. But your approach scared the guy half to death. Again, spiritually. How are we approaching one another when, when we see somebody in sin? And, and Paul says that we need to have a spirit, which by the way, he's talking about the fruit of the spirit, which he already lays out in, in Galatians chapter 5. He, this whole issue of being gentle. Most people in sin, especially people who recognize that they are sinners, already know that. And they feel worthless and guilty already. I think your discernment as you come up from, if you come up across somebody who is still arrogant and prideful and, they're, and, and, and trying to deny, I, I think your approach starts to change. Two by four might come out. But most often, a hand of tenderness, of care, of love, goes a long way. And it's biblical. need to walk in the spirit, showing an attitude that, that, that brings kindness. Casey mentioned humility, thinking less about yourself. That's the approach. And more about the one who is in sin. The one who is stuck And then it's interesting. It gives us an exhortation that, that, that kind of calls for self-examination. At the end of verse 1, he says, Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Uh, that's self-reflection. That's making sure that we understand exactly what's going on. That's removing the pride and leaving the rocks in the pouch. How often when we see somebody sin, we, we start throwing the rock and say, oh, I would never do that. How dare he do that? How, how dare she do that? Why are they walking around in gloom and despair? Keep your rocks in your pouch and approach somebody because you too might be tempted and fall in the same sin. It's humbling. It's humbling.
He goes on in verse 2. And he says, and this is an exhortation, this is in the present tense, this is something that we must continually do. He says, bear one another's burdens. And thereby fulfill the law of Christ. This has the idea of accountability. This has the idea of seeing somebody deep in despair or somebody in a sin and you have great care for them. You're there to restore, but it's not there just to restore. It's there to, to walk with their healing. And, and they need help. It's not simply enough to help turn them from their sin. We, we need to bear the load with them. This word bear has that idea. Has the thought of carrying a load with, with endurance. A lot of times we think, okay, I'm going to pick up the load, but I'm going to put it back down. This is the idea of saying, you know what? Your life is spinning out of control and you need someone to come alongside you and I'm going to hold your hand through it. If that takes years, months, whatever the case. The question you need to understand again is that the reason we do such a thing, the exhortation is for our souls, those who are redeemed in Christ Jesus, is because they are weak. And the load is too heavy for them to carry themselves. And they need a person to come alongside them that, that will love them, and encourage them, and point them to Christ and bear the load with them. Let me say this, because I, I think this needs to be said as well. That's the exhortation for the restorer, but let me tell you the one who's caught in the sin. Let me just tell you this, because I've seen this. Don't be so prideful in thinking that you don't need help. And allow help to come. If this is the exhortation of the body of Christ, allow that and receive that with his grace. We live in a society where we think that we got it all figured out. How are things going? Okay. Reality, life sucks. And too often we're, we're too prideful to, to let somebody in. And somebody to help. But why? Because we're tender. We're tender there and we're weak. Especially for the fear of the one who's spiritually depressed. They're wondering, is this going to add to the hurt or is this going to help in the cause? That's why your attitude is so imperative as you come alongside one another. James tells us in James 5, 16, he says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Interesting to me that God would use others in our lives. And of course, the restorer is pointing them to, to the greatness and the character and the awesomeness of God. Allowing his truth to, to heal a hurting heart. All that to say, beloved, we need each other. We need each other. And then he gives this promise. He says, oh wow. And thereby fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? What is fulfilling that? Why is this so imperative? Well, Jesus said this in John 13, 34. A new commandment I give you that you love one another even as I have loved you. How receptive are we allowing people into our lives and, and, and are we engaging others in the midst of all that? Of course, it's unconditional love that we've experienced from Jesus. A love that knows no, no boundaries. Knowing that his grace goes deeper than our sin. Picking each other up. Holding each other up is the exhortation in Galatians 6, 1 and 2. 
time is really gone for me, but I want to quickly just give you just a couple of other things about some help that harms, because this needs to be said as well. What do I mean by that? You can give help that harms. As much as we want to help, we respond to the exhortation in Galatians 6, 1 and 2, and we can do more harm than good. Especially in spiritual depression, make a person continual to aspire. Charles Spurgeon, the great English preacher, called the Prince of Preachers. We, you've seen him. I brought him up in, in our display and during this series. A man who experienced much turmoil in his own life. He speaks to this issue. And he speaks to his own heart in this when he says, Ah, says someone, or says one. I used to laugh at Mrs. So-and-so for being nervous. Now that I feel the torture myself, I am sorry that I was ever hard on her. Ah, says another. I used to think such and such a person that, that he must be a fool to be always in so gloomy a state of mind. But now I cannot help shrink, sinking into the same despondent frames of, oh, I would to God that I had been more kind to him. Checks his own soul in this. And then he says something I think is, is, is very profound. This last sentence, he says, yes, we should feel more for the prisoner if we knew more about the prison. Spurgeon's heart changed for those who are engaged. Too often, I think, that we can live life with a flippant answer and don't understand why a person is doing or what's happening in their life. May we have a heart to understand the prison that they find themselves in. So that we can come and restore the prisoner. Real quickly, what's a list of, of, of harms? Judging others. Judging others according to our circumstances rather than theirs. Another one, our words are trite and they blow in the wind with no heart behind them. Do we think before we speak? Another harmful thing is that, that we resist humility and we walk with spiritual pride thinking our life is better than everybody else around us. A Pharisee. Or how about this last one? Don't go. Why haven't they got over it? It's been three months. It's been a year. What's wrong with your spiritual understanding? Which speaks to our lack of patience and love. Know that your experience... speaks to possibly some help into a soul that needs it. And may he show the kindness and care, much what, what Spurgeon had said. There's benefits in sorrow. Let me end with this. Spurgeon saw it this way. He says, I often feel very grateful to God that I have undergone fearful depression. Depending on where you're at in life and spiritual depression, that's a pretty bold statement. He's thankful and grateful to God. I've undergone fearful depression. I, I know the borders of despair and the horrible brink of that gulf of darkness to which my feet have almost gone. Hundreds of times I've been, been able to give a, a helpful grip to brothers and sisters who have come into that same condition, which, which grip I could never have given if I had not known their deep despondency. Your experience in life is a testimony, especially the testimony of God's grace in it, and people sometimes need that helping hand. Are there benefits in, in sorrow? Yes. 
Let me just give you a, a quick list. Sorrow leads to, us, uh, to a greater maturity in Christ. Sorrow leads us to, to deeper intimacy with God. Sorrow teaches us empathy for others. Much what Spurgeon said. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to end with this verse. Actually, two of them here. He says, for just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, which is a very interesting statement. Paul rejoices in the fact that he knows that his Savior is going to suffer. And, and that, guess what? Our, our sufferings in Christ Jesus are going to be plentiful. But he also says this, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. I thought of that. I understand the comfort aspect of things. When affliction comes and somebody else has experienced the same affliction, you understand the course and the path that you're, that you're, you're, you're going in Christ Jesus. But salvation? Why is that there? Here's the reason why it's there. Because Paul knows the power of the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter what comes against him. And he will be afflicted day in and day out. He's saying that his afflictions are for our comfort and salvation. That we know what we believe is true and we continue on. He finishes that verse. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. He identifies with it. What's this concluding sermon about? It's about us being spiritually aware of what's around us. It's looking outside of ourselves and our needs. You all got responsibilities. You probably got your day laid, uh, laid out. You got some things going on. Would we consider to interrupt those plans when somebody is hurting? That's Paul's point. We who have the mind of Christ and are saved by Christ that we would be people who restore like Christ, that we give time. The psalmist says, my prayer phrase, I, I plan my days, but God directs my steps. Are we attuned to each other's needs? Understand, I'm not talking about self help here. Are we attuned? To each other's needs when it comes to our walk with Christ. Let us pray. Father, we again thank you for the exhortation. The word of God being inspired through the Apostle Paul. We are reminded of the need for the body of Christ. Our desire is to give you glory. And you desire your church to function in such a way that, that gives you glory in the way that we live with each other. Slow our lives down, Father. Help us to be attuned to those around us. May we be prayerfully engaged and Holy Spirit motivated to pick up and to hold up those who are stuck in sadness, in despair, and trials. All that is to give you glory. All that is to, to proclaim the goodness of your life. We are nothing, but we are everything in Christ Jesus. And so we love you. And we give you praise. Spirit, have your way with our souls. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.